Welcome to Trending in Education, our special uh, Election Day's Eve episode. This should be dropping the day before the end of official voting in the U.S. election, November 3rd. We're being very timely uh, today because we don't really know who's going to win and we don't know what the the world's going to be like on the other side. So we figured we'd get this one out. And I wanted to get that out with some some sage counsel from colleagues of mine. So we have Melissa Griffith. Welcome back to Trending in Education, Melissa. It's been a little while. Thank you for, for, for gracing us with your presence. I'm here. I'm here to see your special guests. But it's, it's, it's good to be back. It's definitely good to be back. I've, I've been a little busy. Yeah. Elsewhere. Yeah. All and of who, us. Yeah. Please. Who knows the election? I'm trying to have my affairs in order before. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's like... good. That's good. That's good. Uh, good practice. And and then welcoming back to the show, Dr. Mark Sanders has been on the show several times in the past to talk about philosophy, civic engagement, how to engage undergrads, young people who are coming to college, and help them understand how to navigate that difficult time. Mark's also gotten more involved in activating voter registration and some other topics that we're going to talk about on the show. Mark also is is a loyal listener to Trending in Education and is an active Twitter enthusiast, not just about Trending in Education, also about other things good follow on Twitter. Mark, welcome back to Trending in Education. Thanks, Mike. It's good to be here with you and Melissa. I was yeah. thinking maybe we could talk about some Kaplan Warlord stuff, but that's a different episode, I think. Yeah, the, the Score Lords. The Score Lords. We were the Warlords, Warriors, right. and then we were the Score Lords. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah, we, we knew each other then when we were playing basketball, and then we know each other now when we're uh, more focused on podcasting. You can play podcasts longer than you can play basketball, so, yes, uh, yes, so I think uh, that might have been a good move. But but yeah, Mark, so we wanted to bring you in just to get your perspective in general on the crazy year. As someone who our listeners may not be familiar with, I thought it might be good for you to introduce yourself and talk about what kind of got you to this point in your career. And then in particular, talk about what 2020 has been like leading up to a conversation about, about the election and about the role of educators. Yeah, I arrived at this point, in particularly in terms of engaging with student voters in a in an odd way, in the sense that when I was in college, I didn't vote. And I was, in fact, somewhat vocal about not voting. And I think context and times change things. And you can talk about the electoral college and what vote you're in and so on and so forth. But I just have come as a college professor to to understand, I think, the importance of student engagement. Mm -hmm. Uh, And voting is a big part of that. It's not the only part. There's a lot of other things involved in that. So when I got to UNC Charlotte, I got involved in the community engagement aspect of um, education. And that's bigger than just in terms of student voting, but that was one of the uh, the subsets. What what got me there was my general interest in bridging the, the divide between the academy and the outside world, the world which which we are ensconced. And a lot of interesting things going uh, going on there. Community involved projects, experiential learning, very influenced uh, by John Dewey for me in mm-hmm. in going into that area. And then within that, I I became very involved in what's called the 49er Democracy Experience, which started back when Charlotte had the DNC uh, mm-hmm. a long time ago, and I've become increasingly uh, involved in it. And it's a large organization. We try to involve students in various range and faculty administrators in engagement around student voting. The latest iteration of this has been, I've also become involved in an organization called the the Faculty Network for Student Voting Rights. Also known as uh, FACNET. As FACNET for short, yes. And that's an organization that's nationwide. It's for faculty to help them understand what they can be doing to engage and educate students uh, on their voting rights, really. And so that I've just got involved in this past summer. Mm. And while we are really focused right now, ladies are focused on the 2020 election, it's important to keep in mind that the work of student engagement, of citizen engagement in general, continues beyond uh, this particular election. Yeah, yeah. And it's a crazy time to be insert your age here, but it's also got to be a particularly crazy time to be 17 or 18 year old who's just gotten to campus trying to figure out, hey, have they even gotten to campus? Are they even face-to-face? Are they in a dorm? Have their plans changed? And then on top of that, if you you just turned 18 or you're, you're I guess, younger than 22, 
you've never voted in a presidential election before. It's such a charged year. We talk a lot about the importance of, of empathy and trying to understand from the perspective of others. It's got to be a really challenging time for that population. And then beyond that, we've also been educated more in that that is not really the entirety of the student population either. Like not everyone necessarily fits that profile. There's a lot of students who are older, who have uh, children, who are doing, to, you have jobs to juggle. So any perspective on that? Just what it's, who are you engaging with? How do you think about empathize, empathizing with them or just trying to understand what it's like to be in their shoes? And then we could probably extend beyond that to talk about faculty as, as the next piece. But any thoughts on just how uh, you've been able to do that or some experiences you've had so far this year? Yeah, so it's been interesting time again for all of us, no matter what you are doing, it's an interesting right. time for, all, for everybody. And it's interesting because I think I've always known that students are not all just 18 to 21 year olds on a college campus with them. Yeah. I've known for a while that they, they have jobs and some of them have kids, but going rem remote or hybrid, but mostly uh, remote for us, it's become much more clear when, when you see people with their kids in the, the Zoom yeah. meeting that, you, that you're having or mm -hmm. giving or talking about why they can't make this, the Zoom meeting and they go into the, the details of their jobs and so forth. So with the pandemic has really brought into focus uh, a lot of those issues. Mm -hmm. And so I have been like everybody else struggling to grapple with all of the, of these things, but also really inspired by the dedication of these students. Yeah, I'm in a, a weekly meeting with students every week. It's a weekly meeting and the effort that they're putting forth and with the uncertainty. So we, we started planning things back in the, the summer when it was still like, who knows what, September, October is going to, going to yeah. look like. And so they had to plan for things maybe in person and maybe online and yeah. they've just rolled with it. And yeah. the, uh, students at UNC Charlotte, students all across the country have pulled off all kinds of virtual events to get out student, student voting. Mm -hmm. And they've really thought about everything from basic information of where to vote, how to vote, things like that. To, there was a huge movement to get student poll workers because typically poll workers are older. They are going to be most susceptible to COVID and yes. they're still in need in some places, mostly rural places, but like Charlotte had more than they could handle of mm -hmm. people applying to be uh, poll workers. And that's yeah. been um, a, the case a, a, a lot of places. Again, the, my takeaway is that I've been in, inspired by how involved they have and how creative they have been in pulling some of this off. Do you see that it is more engaging now than it was like, say, in 2016 or before? Do you think the students are taking a much more active role? Are they more engaged? I would say they're... yes. It's, it's hard to judge in some ways it could, because we are okay. remote, but I would say yes. It's clear the number of students involved in different activities at UNC Charlotte is greatly increased than, than it was four, uh, four, four, four years ago. There's examples across um, the board. One that comes to mind is athletics. The women's basketball team, for instance, has yeah. been at the forefront of the, wanting 100% voter participation from the team, doing marches to the polls, and other teams are doing this at other colleges too. There's lots of people. And I think a little bit of that comes down from what happened over uh, the summer and the importance that all professional sporting leagues like the, the NBA and WNBA put on mm -hmm. racial uh, issues, but also the accent on voting, how important voting was. Mm -hmm. That's filtered down to college athletics in a really big way. Mm -hmm. and, you, and I see it at UNC C Charlotte. But beyond that, I just see it in your other students too. Uh, they're just more students, more involved in different ways this year than they were four years ago, I would say definitely. Yeah. And then how about the understanding the perspective yourself as faculty, but then also as someone who's been connecting into a network of faculty who are providing support to faculty through this challenging time, any perspective uh, on that side of things? Yeah. So the, the faculty network has been great for me because I've got to connect with people all over uh, the place who have been doing quote unquote, this work, this work of student voter engagement for a long time. Some doing it for longer than I have, some doing it better than I have and more involved yeah. than I have. And some folks that are just brand new to it, they're like, I'm, and, but they're all in. There's a mm -hmm. couple of people on the faculty steering committee that just were like, this is what I need to be doing right now. And they've gone in really committed um, to doing things. And I should also say that the faculty network in particular has gotten a lot of help from, there's a ton of organizations out there that 
really do great work on student voter engagement. And a lot of them are nonprofits that directly work with students. And they have been great to work with, but what Faculty Network is trying to do is trying to connect faculty to get involved and see what they can do. Mm -hmm. But the Andrew Goodman Foundation, All In, SEEP, Social Scholar Strategy Network, all these groups have been just invaluable in connecting people in different ways. But yeah, I would say there is also much more attention being paid to student voter in engagement. Mm -hmm. Just in the number of uh, fellowships that we are, that we've got some, some, of these or, some of these organizations give fellowships to different schools and we have more than we've ever had. And we've yeah. had more input from all whole range of sources. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I imagine this year is challenging for a lot of the faculty you're supporting too. So the idea is you're providing tools and resources, but also maybe a bit of a support network for faculty who still have to deal with all their other responsibilities typically, and then are taking on, in addition to those responsibilities, more of a commitment to, to helping engage with students. That comes with a lot of additional pressures and stresses. So can you talk a little more about that? Yeah, that's, that hit home right there. <laughs> um, I mean... So yeah. Try to make it a little less broad and stress them out. I'm, I'm going to give you some cover. Figure it out, deal with the emotion that you're feeling, and then, and, and then feel free to answer. Yeah, it's difficult to figure out how much time I should be spending on this. I have classes yeah. to teach and things to do. Mm -hmm. So when I can integrate them, that's what I'm really focused on. Yep. What I'm doing is part of the university's mission. The most college and universities mission statement in, includes something about civic engagement, community engagement, being a good citizen. Mm -hmm. So I see that as part of my role. Right. I'm lucky in the sense that as a non-tenured track position, I don't have the pressure to publish a lot of research and peer reviewed journals. I, yep. I do that once in a while, but it's not the same pressure that some people have. So a lot of faculty who are tenured, tenure track are really feeling that pressure and are uncertain of how to do it this year when yeah. conference is are up in the mm -hmm. air and things like that. And most universities that I am aware of are have an understanding of that. And in people's tenure review, it'll look yeah. a little different this yeah. year. Yeah, if the clock is not paused, the, the year is considered different yes. because it is a different year, which yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. If it's not paused, it is considered different. There's love exceptions made to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't feel those kind of pressures, mm -hmm. but I do feel the pressure of how much can I how much of my time should I be devoting to the content of my classes? And again, I'm lucky in that some of the content of my classes is directly about civic engagement. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's where I'm going. You struck a chord in, in my mind when you said it, right? So I'll give you an example. So when I was in college around that age, a wee long time ago, I, I had a professor, uh, the parallel was talk a lot about religion in the class and he was anti-Catholic and I'm Catholic. And that struck a, even though he was just talking about religion in general, you can get that element of he was not, he was anti-Catholic. And so it made me feel not so good and I didn't love the class. I'm curious, so I, as you're trying to balance, because I'm sure this comes up, as you're trying to balance getting people more engaged in voting, in this world that is absolutely way too politicized, how is it that you are, how do you balance the not pushing your own view on like the actual, I, I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republic or I'm an independent versus just, we all should participate in the process. Like how do you balance that in class? Yeah, so again, I think that's what scares a lot of faculty and it's difficult, but I, I think it's also not that difficult if people set certain um, parameters. So yeah, so it's really striking that, that as that you would feel an, an anti-Catholic attitude from somebody like that strikes me as really. That was so um, I would just call it a long time ago. Yeah. long time ago. Right. <laughs> no, but, but, but I'm saying I can understand somebody who who is religious who feels yeah. their religion yeah. under attack in a philosophy class where I'm talking about that's just. Like, but I try to talk about yeah. the idea that if you have a certain belief and it's a belief based on faith, then that's what it is, and that's different from arguing in a kind of logical analysis. Mm -hmm. But I, I would stick, I would steer away from picking on a certain religions. In terms of, of nonpartisanship, yeah. again, it's difficult, but I think you can stick to some basic things. And so, like the importance of media literacy, the importance of finding out what's true and, and, uh, and what's not, engaging in critical thinking, mm -hmm. these are, are things that are inherently teachable in the election and, and political process. And you can do that. In, now, so, 
you can do that in ways that are, are nonpartisan. And sometimes you have to be extra cautious, but you can do that. So if you're giving examples of yeah. when I teach like media literacy and I go to examples, some people say, just avoid politics, just keep it to healthcare. Mm -hmm. That's going to be political too. Yeah. So you just have to find about, and it's in, and in politics, yeah in a really bad way, it's easy to find examples on all sides. So you can find something that it might be easier to find more of something that the president said than Joe Biden said, but you can find examples of across the political spectrum of people lying, of people using disinformation or misinformation, and mm -hmm. you can use those to explain the difference between them. So I think if you, if you are aware and you think about it, you can find examples in politics that can come off, it should come off as nonpartisan, and you yeah. really are concerned with trying to use critical thinking skills, use your kind of civic media literacy skills, which again, both of those, while clearly usable in this context, are usable beyond this context. In students' everyday life, they should be learning how to engage with social media, how to engage with digital media, mm -hmm. Um, in general and how to ascertain good sources from bad sources. So that's what I tried to, to, to focus on. And like I said, there's almost no topic that can't be understood as political. So I try to give multiple examples uh, of things and then just use goofy, funny things that are as, as non-political as you can get. Yeah. And then what about in philosophy itself, teaching your philosophy classes one of the topics we talk about a lot on the show is the importance of relevance, where if people don't understand, it's a kid in the back class, like, why are we learning this? If you can't answer that question, you may have a hard time keeping the class. Mm -hmm. This is a year where everyone's, their lives are driving that relevance conversation, that engagement may naturally be there. But then how do you tap into it, either for voter engagement, but then in particular, is philosophy in some ways part of the solution, I guess. Are there ways in which you can say, by virtue of teaching you better ways of thinking and exposing you to these other ideas, I'll help you start to grapple with some of these questions in new ways. Like, I'd just love to get any of your perspective on this. Yeah, that's, so I think part of the, the what makes it easier for me is when I've always taught philosophy by bringing in contemporary current examples that can sometimes be touchy for some people. And I'm trying to, I try to be uh, careful when I do it, but it's always uh, the case for me. So when I was you know, just yesterday, I was teaching Mill and teaching the, the idea of tyranny of the uh, majority, uh, which is something for me that I just, I know, and I inherently get, and it's a challenge to explain this to students and especially students on zoom who are, it's so much easier to not ask questions. It's like, yeah, yeah, I get it. And then I ask them for an example and they can't come up with one. Yeah. And so I give them these different examples and they're weird. So I just dig in and say, okay, let's think about people who don't want to wear masks or people who do want to wear masks and keep it and use an exaggerated situation and, and say, even if you think you shouldn't have to wear a mask, if you believe that you are, because they're not going to hurt you, it's, if it's endangering others, mm -hmm. you're the majority who thinks that's still potentially an example of tyranny of the majority, because you are not taking into account everyone else in your the well-being everyone else in your um community so so obviously i know what the tyranny of the majority is but for our listeners who don't know what it is why why, why don't you give an example of what yeah, it is wow now you're, now you're putting me on the spot to explain to your <laughs> listeners who i don't know anything about their background but so i would say tyranny of the majority as i understand it uh, at least as, as, as mill talks about it is when a majority of people takes advantage of the simple rule of majority rule, which Mill thinks is crucial to a democracy when the majority of people think something that's what should rule the day. Yeah. But you should not just be limited by that. You should take into account minority opinions mm -hmm. and weigh that when you are deciding something so that when you decide something that might benefit you, but would really harm others, then maybe you shouldn't do it. And again, there are some instances where one side's going to get harmed, you're going to vote in your best self-interest, that's one thing. When you don't take into account and you are for something, say, I don't want to be inconvenienced that I can't go anywhere I want to ever, right. as opposed to saying, well, if you yeah. wear a mask in these three places, you will keep the lives of a bunch of people safe. That can begin to sound like, okay, that's, I get it now. I shouldn't be doing that because if I'm doing it, I'm partaking in what Mill calls the tyranny where the majority acts tyrannical 
in their own, only considering their own regard and not considering others. Yeah. Yeah. Particularly interesting when we're heading towards just a bunch of different pluralities too, at least depending on how you cut the demographics uh, in the U.S. where the used to, perhaps there was even a tyranny of the majority previously, but now it's harder to maintain since the demographics are shifting. But that's a topic of perhaps another podcast episode. But, But yeah, so... What about the the emotional toll? And we like to talk about social and emotional uh, learning and trying to support the, the students, support the, yourself and, and other faculty who are going through this challenging year. It's something I think we've all been um, given a crash course, I think, on social emotional learning and, and empathy and all that. People are going to be very emotionally engaged on November 3rd, as the results come in, whether the results come in or not, some people are going to be happy, some people are going to be unhappy. How are you thinking about that aspect of your role and of the role of educators through the, maybe the rest of 2020? Yeah, so that's a lot of what these various groups, both locally at UNC Charlotte and broader and and faculty network, we are turning to now. Okay. From even, you know, what what are students going to, if there's an early voting site on campus, are they, are students, do students feel safe? Are there people there at all protesting and whatnot? But then to really to what happens after the election. And there's a lot of work being done. And this is when, you know, this is in some, in fact, we have to recognize, you don't have to be a, a political or democratic expert to care about student, student voting, but you have to know what your role is. And so this is where the counseling and psychological centers on campus come in. Yeah. And so I know at UNC Charlotte, they are having a series of events both next week and then right after the uh, election. Mm. And again, these are sources that and I have been doing double and triple duty since COVID too. Yeah, so, right. so they really are making themselves open to students who want to talk about things and know about things. But then there's the role that as a faculty member, and again, not giving too much advice to how to do things, but to give faculty some kind of guidelines on how to help people, how to help students deal with it, and how to help yourself deal with it. And for one thing, it's just acknowledge it. Don't come in the day after election day if you're having class and act like it's just another day, no matter what's happened. Take some time to acknowledge it in some way. And then again, just be cognizant. Don't assume that what your students are, are feeling or why that they are, they are, they're feeling that. And give them the space. And to me, that means if they don't want to come to class on the day after election, now that's, that's okay to me. Now, administration might have something else to, to say about that, but there is some control on the faculty level about student absences on a day-to-day basis. Yep. So I think that's important. A bunch of guides that are being put out now, JMU, James Madison University has just put one out that just give faculty a few tips on what to look for and, 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 and how to deal with various things. But again, I think the, the like for at UNC Charlotte, the counseling and psychological centers are really an invaluable source to help students who are dealing with a range of issues, how they feel on campus. Maybe they're living at home with family members who have very different political views. Yeah. So I think faculty at the minimum just need to be aware that this is happening and be able to talk to students a little bit about it and then point them to the right sources that can really help them if they're having issues. So Mike touched on this a little bit early on, right? There are a lot of students that are on your campus right now who may be first, first-time voters, and they're coming into politics at a time where we are extremely partisan. How do you prepare those students? My biggest worry, and maybe I'm projecting, I'm asking you how to prepare me as well. My biggest worry is no matter who wins, there's a not small group of people that we risk in disillusion. And that's what the last four years have done. It's pulled us even further apart, or maybe just exposed how far apart we are. And then I think that is a challenge in the, in the United States right now. How do you start to raise the next generation to understand that differences are okay, and finding compromises is actually what the, the government should be built on and how we should be moving forward? Yeah, that's no easy task, and I think it's yeah. the task that is, is a long-term task to be done. So in the immediate aftermath, how do you have, yeah. and I think, so people, how do you have civil conversations about this? Because you don't want to say, oh, it's too yeah. polarized, it's too much, you can't talk about it. That's not going to work. At the same time, I want to say, I would be forgiving of people who don't feel civil the day or two after the election, potentially, mm-hmm. on yeah. various sides. But long-term, you should be introducing frameworks that 
try to get uh, compromise some way or how can you con how can you come together around certain ideas right what do you want a community where you feel safe what does that look like for different people do you want uh, a community where you can have your voice be heard what does that look like and so you try to find some kind of very general common ground and have conversations like that and once again there are lots of great groups out there a lot of the student organizations student voting organizations that i've talked about have these things some of the broader ones too campus compact which is a, a, a national organization with state chapters have a lot of tools for what they sometimes call deliberative dialogues or sometimes, sometimes they call civilly engaged dialogues and there's a lot of folks out there doing that work and they come in and give workshops and there's material online that you can get and so again that will be more important than ever going forward after the election so when the work to make the country less polarized than it is well, also, I would say, I think what one would hope for is some sort of moderate success, right? That there are going to be people that don't want to engage yeah. in that, and you have to be as accommodating as possible, but you don't need to accommodate people who are not accommodating. How tolerant do you have to be of intolerant people? You need to make the best effort that you can and go from there. Yeah. Yeah. So we're getting close to time. I also, I, I hear birds, which... Oh, is that <laughs> I think it's nice. Oh, I thought it's it was kind just of pleasant, me. But, uh, but if people are hearing birds, it's nice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, those are just birds outside my window here in lovely Charlotte, North Carolina. Nice. They're, they're expressing their interest in, in, in voting engagement too. Yeah, well, that's great. And then, uh, Mark, I was wondering, just if folks are a little shook these days, I think we all are, do you have any recommendations uh, or any perspectives that you could draw from philosophy? Like you were talking about John Stuart Mill, you were talking about John Dewey, but... When you face some of these challenges on a personal level, are there particular thinkers that you refer to? Or are there any recommendations you have for our listeners as far as just helping to use, use some of the, the works of philosophers that are out there that might actually help us navigate these trying times? Oof, that's a tough one. I think there's individual philosophers that can help with specific aspects. In terms of philosophers that I think can help you cope with things the best, I would probably turn to the existentialists, mm -hmm. uh, at least for, for me. And I'm always taken by existentialists and other philosophers, other just intellectuals who wrote during the time of World War II in Europe when mm -hmm. things, are, things were really dismal for some people. Mm -hmm. And they found ways to find hope and so forth. So people like Camus in that time, I find really inspiring today. I think Rent and others too, I think I find inspiring in terms of coping with what's going on. And also I think I would look to them too, I think for Camus and his political philosophy in showing us ways in which to guide ourselves by being able to take principal stands, but doing it in a non-dogmatic way in ways that we can lead ourselves to, to better days, no matter how bleak some things might look mm -hmm. but it's always good to read uh Camus. Yeah. yeah do you have any concluding thoughts mark i know it's a confusing time i definitely appreciate uh you taking the time to be on the show and to share your perspective but but any any closing notes that you think are relevant any resources you've been citing a bunch of them is there uh is there anywhere in particular that folks want to follow you or if they want to understand some of the stuff that you talked about on today's show where should they go so yeah, you can follow me at, at citizen underscore Sanders on Twitter. As you mentioned, I'm on there a lot. Mm -hmm. And unlike a lot of folks, I actually find really good conversations there. I think if you curate it correctly, you can really have good conversations. Yeah, philosophy Twitter, hip hop Twitter, and yeah. sports Twitter are all pretty pretty comfortable zones to be operating. And I've seen you in all three. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And so yeah, listeners can you know reach out to me if they have questions or more of these things. I'd also direct them to the faculty network. The website is facultyforvotingrights.org. Okay. Um, we have a resources page there that connects you to all of these things. So if you're a faculty member, if you're a student, uh, or even if you're not, but you're interested in some of the kind of civil discourses or things like that, a lot of great resources on that, that uh, web page. And, and if you're a faculty member, you, we, I welcome you to, to, to join us. It's very easy to, to, to join the faculty network. Yeah. Uh, because whatever happens, we need to continue this kind of work of realizing how important it is to engage students 
in this process. And we as faculty members, it's one more way to help us relate to the student, to put us in their perspective. What do they need at this time? That'll help us teach them better. That'll help yeah. us understand them as full human, human beings better. Yeah. Yeah, and you wind up modeling for them how to be the citizens. In a best case scenario, yes. you're modeling that behavior for them, which is great. Any concluding thoughts? So, Mark, as uh, folks are listening to this right around election day, maybe a day or two after, I know, who was it? I think, Dan, rather, you still always sign off with courage. If you have you have some words of wisdom, words of advice, or parting shots. So I would just say, courage is a good one. It's very much a good one. But I'd also just say, this will come out on the day before election day. And if you haven't already voted, vote. And I would say vote and stay engaged. Don't just vote and be done with it. Vote and stay engaged. And lastly, it's as important, I think, to take care of yourself. Definitely vote and stay engaged, but it's okay to take breaks once in a while, but don't give up. Vote and stay engaged and take care of yourself. Yeah. Great advice. And keep listening. We're planning to continue to release uh, podcasts. So thank you for sticking with us to this point. And uh, we got plenty on tap. The, it'll be an interesting discourse. I think it's just going to be more more of an active engagement moving forward. And we're trying to watch trends. We're not really sure what we're going to see next. So we just play with our head up, keep our eyes open. Melissa, thank you for joining us yet again on Trending in Education. Always a pleasure to have you. And Dr. Mark Sanders, thanks for your work, Citizen Sanders. We appreciate it. And thanks as always to our listeners for listening. Thank you.